just is satisfied. Now write your mercy on my heart and hands, rock of ages, in faith I stand. Rock of ages, my great hope secure. The Father's hold just like an anchor to my soul. Good morning. Welcome to River Oaks Presbyterian Church. We are excited that you're here. My name is Josh Holstein. I'm the youth pastor here. And we are here to sing and worship to the God who cried out, it is done. And would you guys stand, if you're able, for this call to worship as we prepare our hearts. We find this from Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you, but for me it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Would you pray with me? Father, we come and we worship you who does hold us dear. You who brings us close to yourself because you are above all. You are Lord of lords and King of kings. And we can find refuge in you. Would we see you as beautiful, loving, and kind this morning? I praise your name. Amen.
I listened to a street preacher who uh, how he talked about how Christians should be completely free of sin and how he hadn't sinned in a number of years. Even as a 19-year-old, though, I knew that the first step of obedience was love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I knew I couldn't do that for more than 10 minutes, and neither could he. And that is why we confess our sins every week. Let's do that right now. Lord God in heaven, you are the source of all love. You ought to be our vision. And you are most high. And your strength is where we derive our strength. But we confess, Father, that we have often abused our power. Instead of stewarding our power for good, we have lorded it over others. Instead of building others up with our strength, we have torn them down to make ourselves feel more powerful. Instead of using our power to give voice to those who have not had a voice, we have too often hoarded our power and privilege. We've too often used scripture as a weapon to win arguments and flexed our theological knowledge to silence people who disagree with us, rather than using scripture as a source of life to help care for those around us. Forgive us, Father, and teach us how to use our power in a godly way. Lord Jesus, thank you that you did not hold on to your power. Rather, you became a nobody, a servant in order to serve us. And now with all authority in heaven and on earth given to you, you give us all we need for life and godliness. Holy Spirit, help us not to fear the loss of our power, for we know that we will never lose your presence and eternal life in your kingdom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Having confessed our sins, please stand and hear this good news from Romans chapter 6. We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Let's keep singing.
There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is. Presbyterian Church, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you for getting here on time and fighting for the back seats. I just love to see that. And uh, when the parents wouldn't take their children out, we are uh, starting everything up. It's promotion Sunday, and fifth grade Sunday school is starting today. So if you have anything, a fifth grader or below, you're welcome to walk them out, and there will be people in the lobby uh, to meet you and show your kids where to go. It's okay to stay. Uh, I'm just kidding. I love those kids. It's fun to see. 
It's a real blessing of the Lord to have so many children. I'm very, very thankful for that. Uh, to the rest of you, <laughs> I've got a few announcements. Uh, next week, you know, a big part of our church is community groups. I really want, our, our prayer for you is that your best friends in the world will be in this church and um, in, the, in their heart. I think going to a community group is hard. You have to go up to a house, probably a house you haven't been to very often. You're not even sure you're at the right address. You have to knock on the door. You have to, you, you hope you're not greeted by a Doberman Pinscher. You uh, hope you're in the right house. You, you hope that somebody's going to talk to you because they're all friends. I think it's just hard. I, I probably am talking to you out of doing it. I, I didn't mean to do that. So we're going to do a couple of things to make it easier to join community groups. Next week, in between the services, we're going to have a connect breakfast. The community groups are going to compete to see who can make the best breakfast for us. Uh, after the service, the sermon will be a little shorter. Maybe. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to go outside in the Grove where it's nice and beautiful out there now. And uh, just let you kind of go around. The, each community group will have a table. And uh, you get to know them and find out more about the community group itself and, and find one that you think you would feel comfortable going to. So I hope you'll come to that um, or stick around. Actually, we kind of have you captive. Like, you pretty much are going to walk out into it. Um, but I really do hope you'll at least come by and get a bagel and, and give it a thought because those groups are, are important and they're a real blessing. And then the next week is Labor Day weekend. And uh, in honor of the Lord who's given us rest from our labors, we are going to have a big picnic service. That means, uh, that means bring your own food. But uh, we are going to meet out in the Grove. We're only going to do it during second service, 1045. And, uh, you know, all during COVID, we met outside in the Grove. And people loved it so much that we made it pretty out there. And now we're going to worship out there a couple times a year. And so next week will be one of those we- uh, Labor Day will be one of those weeks. So uh, please come, come prepare for that. And finally, um, I need somebody in here to use their gifts. I don't know who you are, but I'm about to make your day because you think to yourself, I can't do ministry. I'm a nerd. Now, if you think that's an insulting word, I'm not talking to you. But some of you know that nerds rule the world these days. And I need two of you. I need one of you to learn how to run the soundboard. Now, that's more than just a computer, right? You need to have an ear for music. You need to be able to, I can't tell good music from bad music. People, when I sing loud, people look at me and they're like, are you aware of the tune that's playing? No, the answer is no. So, you know, do not do that if you're like me. But if you have a good ear for music, if you would be more comfortable behind a soundboard than in uh, the congregation, and you want Dustin to train you, we need, we lost one of our uh, sound technicians who went to college and so we need, uh, we need another one. We just need, we need backups. And secondly, we need somebody else besides Tim who knows how to put our services on stream. Uh, if, if we're, I mean, we've got other people who can do it, but not real, you know, just not confidently. And so if you think you could manage the cameras and stream the service when Tim's not here, I need you to uh, go and ask him to train you to do that. Dustin and Tim, will you all raise your hands? I think everybody knows where you all stand, but... Um, Thank you. All right, let's pray, and then we will uh, dig in. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for bringing us uh, to worship. Thank you for smiling on us during worship. Thank you for assuring us of your presence, promising us that whenever we gather together, you would be here, promising us that you would inhabit the praises of your people, Lord. We know you are here, and we know that there are people in this room who need you. And I pray, Lord, that you would answer their questions today. I don't know what their questions are, but you do. You know the deepest needs of their hearts. Would you please answer? There are some in here who need you to prove that you exist. Would you do that? There are some in here who need you to remind them that, they are, that you are good. Would you remind them? We pray in Jesus' precious, perfect, and holy name. Amen. 
My mom, growing up, growing up in a small town and living her entire life in a small town, had basically one doctor her whole life. From the time she was a, a pretty small girl until he retired, you know, 50 some odd years later, Dr. Wells was the doctor for Dresden, Tennessee. And Dr. Wells, I only knew him as an old man. I'm sure he was young, but he wasn't in my lifetime. And uh, he sounded and looked just like Perry Mason, just like uh, Raymond Burr and Perry Mason, and then later in Ironsides. If you ever saw what he looked like there, and that deep voice, and that was him. I mean, I honestly, as a very young kid, thought he was Ironsides. Um, I was like, wow, he's a doctor, and he does that. Um, and when he retired, the whole town um, came out. It was a big deal, and there's kind of a receiving line, and um, you just can't imagine kind of the intimacy that if you have one town doctor, how everybody just you know, feels close to that man. And, and so my mom, I remember she took me with her. I was like eight, so I had to come. And uh, she brought him a cake, and she said, Dr. Wells, you've just always been there for me. And she, our ties started tearing up. And she said, you know, when Janet, when she, when, when she was born with her disabilities, you were there for me. And, and when my brother Ronnie had polio, you were there for me. And, and when you know, when, when Tommy was born, and, and you, you, you made me promise that I wouldn't have another child, but I did, and, and he was born, and he had, you know, the, the rec- RH negative blood, and, and he had to get a f- complete blood transfusion the day he was born. You were there for me, and you saved him, and, and when, when Ricky was born, and just all the terrible things that involved that, <laughs> you, you were there for me, and Dr. Wells, I just... Now that you're retiring, I just want to tell you, I think you're bad luck. (laughs) And I certainly thought he was bad luck. I mean, I never enjoyed going to see him. He was a terrible man. He gave me a smallpox shot. I was fine when I went. If those of you who are too young for smallpox shots, you should be thankful for those of us who did it for you. We still have the scars, and um, he... You were fine when you went in, and you were sick as a dog the next day. And like, he made me sick. And every time I went in, he would bang on my knees, and he would put, and he was way past the lollipop days, you know. He'd just put that cold stethoscope on your chest and stick out your tongue and stick that popsicle stick down my throat. And, and it was never a good sign to go see Dr. Wells. And so I began to blame him for me being sick. That's a natural thing to do when you're small and you don't understand. It's his fault I have to get shots. It's his fault I, I'm, I'm sick. And we know now that we're adults that that's foolish. And he was actually trying to keep me alive. But some of the things he did to me were painful. And I began to associate him with it. The question for today is, if God is good, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? And the answer is that God is not the reason for the pain and the suffering. He's keeping us alive through it. Now, I want to just say this right now, and I want to be very clear. I believe that the answer the Bible gives, and the answer I'm going to give you this morning is intellectually satisfying. You may or may not believe it. That is up to you. But it is intellectually, philosophically sound and satisfying. It is not illogical that a good God could allow pain for a bigger purpose. That's Everybody who's a parent knows that, right? You allow your children to go through hard things because you want them to mature and be Uh, adults. It's not illogical that a good God could allow pain for a bigger purpose. Now, the problem is that's not where any of these questions come from. They're not intellectual questions. They're emotional questions because it hurts. Sometimes it's just too painful. Life gets too painful, and you begin to wonder, Lord, what are you good for? That's a hard place to be, and I understand that, and I have been in that place many times. And I do believe the the answer of the gospel is also emotionally satisfying. I need you to hang in there with me till we get there. 
But I want you to know right up front, I've been there with you. Most recently, in the, in the weeks leading up to my mom's death, I took a lot of walks, and I wrote a lot in my journal, and I don't let anybody read that journal. On the front page of that journal, it says, stop. I don't want anybody to know I ever thought this. And I'm going to share with you something very ugly, okay? So just because I want you to understand that I'm with you. But I was praying. I remember exactly where I was when, you know, my mom was on her deathbed, and I was thinking about how painful her life had been and the things she had gone through. And I finally just stopped, and I said out loud, Lord, it sure is convenient for you that I have to wait till I die to see if you're real. That's a dark place. But that's where pain and suffering can take you. And I get that. I get it. That's where Psalm 73, we read Psalm 73 as a call to worship today, and that's where it starts out. He starts out saying, I envy the arrogant, the rich. They have no problems in life. They're, they're, they're sinful, but they have a better life than I do. How can you possibly exist? My feet are about to slip. But he ends in a place saying, I have nothing on earth that I desire but you. And heaven has nothing for me except you. And, and we can get to that place together if we'll walk together. Please stand as, I, as we read and see that, that God is patiently bearing with all the pain of the world so that his children can come to glory. God is patiently bearing with all the world and all the pain in the world until his children come to glory. We're going to read two different texts today. First from Matthew chapter 13. It's the parable of Jesus. It says, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in the bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then secondly, from Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Thus far, the reading of God's Word, all men are like grass, and all of our glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but not God's Word. God's Word stands forever. Amen. You may be seated. If God is good, why does He allow suffering? And we respond, God bears with the pain in the world until He can bring all of His children to glory. Now, this question is going to break the world into two groups. Uh, one group is going to say there is so much pain in the world that a good God cannot exist. The other group is going to say there is so much pain in the world that I could not survive if God did not exist. The same uh, sun that melts butter hardens clay. Uh, the, the, the persecutions of the world don't make you who you are. They reveal to you who you are. And, um, and if you can't, if you've never submitted to this, if you never have come to Christ 
uh, in weakness and say, I don't understand it, but I can't live without you, then I pray that you will today. Either God is a monster or life is a monster. And I pray that God reveals the truth to you today. Now, the first thing I want you to see is the world we live in. It doesn't have one disease. It has three diseases. If we're going to use this picture of God as the doctor, then the world, we, to understand what life is like, what life, not really the world, what life is like, it has three diseases. Now, the first disease is sin. Sin entered the world first. And now what you're thinking, sin, that's fun. That's the good stuff. It can't be sin that makes life awful. Sin makes life manageable, right? Um, Russell, uh, Russell Brand, the comedian who's also a heroin addict, uh, says, uh, said of his addiction, heroin was not my problem. Life was my problem. Heroin was my cure. That's, um, that's, kinda, that's how we tend to think, right? But I want you to really think about it. What has sin brought into the world? Abandonment, adultery, assault, abortion. That's just the A's. Broken promises, lies, uh, slander, slavery, sex trafficking, rape, murder, theft. The list goes on and on and on, and there's everyone in here can tell stories about how sin has, has gotten to them and just hurt them terribly. Our own sins, addiction, other people's sins, the things they've done to us. They, they've gotten into our souls. They, they've hurt us badly. Romans 3 says, there's no one who is righteous, not even one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. Romans 1 says that we are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. That's one thing that makes life awful. And that is not... God's fault, that is a result of turning away from him. It's not God. God didn't make the world ruthless, foolish, and hateful. But we've done that to each other by turning away from God, by breaking off our relationship with him. We have made him, and we have made this world intolerable. And we want to minimize our sin instead of honestly embracing the, the pain that our sin has caused. The first disease in the world is sin. Well, sin didn't come into the world alone. Uh, my New Testament professor, he, would, he described it like this. Sin snuck in through the window, and then he opened the front door and allowed in his, his bully, his muscle, death. Death is a thing. It's hard for us to understand it uh, in the true way. We see death as kind of the natural end, or we kind of think of death as the natural end of things until we start talking about our death, and then that changes pretty drastically. But, but death is, is in the world. It's a living thing. That's how God describes it. Uh, Paul says, you know, uh, he says that Christ will reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be defeated is death. He personifies it. Because death is it's like an infection. It's a virus. It's just moving forward. And it's coming after us. It's not just the final death. We're not talking about the final death when you go into the grave. It's the continual sickness, plagues, disease, dementia. Growing old with all of its negative consequences. That's the reign of death. That's where we're living. It's just always coming forward. Think of the, the amount of pain that comes from that. Watching someone with sickness. I mean, I've been to many and many uh, funerals and uh, hospitals when someone passed away and and oftentimes the first thing that someone will say I'll come to them and say I'm really sorry 
And they'll say, well, his suffering is over. And my response is always, I'm sorry he was suffering. I'm sorry he got old. I'm sorry he lost his memory. I'm sorry that he lost his ability to take care of himself. All of that is wrong. That is not how God created this world to function. That shouldn't have happened. And I'm sorry about it all. And again, God did not bring death into the world. He is life, and he is light. But when we turned away from him, we turned to death, even though we didn't know it. We thought we were seeking our freedom, uh, but we found slavery to death. Seeking our freedom, we found slavery to death. And that brings up the third disease in this world. The third disease, I, I put it in the bulletin as uh, the prince of the power of the air. That's from Ephesians 2. He says, You were once dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Just going the way everybody else is going. Following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, it's hard to bring up Satan because you always have this idea in your mind of a guy in a red onesie uh, with horns. And uh, I dressed up as a devil once and I had a red onesie. It was very cute. Uh, I, was in, I was in high school. I was old. But um, I won the award. The guys didn't think very much of me. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the power of the air, what's in the air. The stuff that we just do by nature and we don't even think about it even though it's ruining us. You know, there's a famous uh, speech and uh, he talks about a man walking by a stream and looking down at two fish and saying, how do you swim in such polluted water? And he walks off and the fish look at each other and go, what's water? It's just there. Right? And we swim in polluted water, and we don't even know that it's water. But we constantly have these ideas that just kind of come up. Greed. Of course I'll do anything for money. Of course I'll, I'll abandon myself for money. That's, that's ridiculous. Why wouldn't I? Perfectionism. Of course I want my kids to be perfect. Of course I'm going to correct them 40 times a day and encourage them once, maybe. Uh, of course. That, why would I want my kids to be less than perfect? Uh, you know, beauty. I, of course I am worth what I look like in the mirror. Everybody knows that. Uh, Self-harm. It makes you feel better. It's good therapy to, to hurt yourself. Sexual liberation. I, Bianca and I watched, for some odd reason, I got stuck on Susan St. James the other day. I just was thinking about her because she was so funny when I was a kid. And so I looked up this movie, uh, How to Beat the High Cost of Living. It was hilarious. It was from 1980. And, uh, you know, it was all about sexual liberation. If you could only just liberate, that you'll be have fun and joy and, and all this repressiveness. That's what's been holding us down. And it's just, fun. it's, well, it would be funny if it weren't so tragic. You know what that, we know what that resulted in. We know what the liberation was. It was liberation from your marriage. I, uh, every time my generation gets criticized, I, I think it's just hilarious. I really do. And people want to talk about different reasons. And this is such a, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a generation with no friends. They're all isolated. It's an isolated generation. It's a disconnected generation. And people want to blame Facebook. And I'm like, no, why don't we go back and look at divorce? Because my generation grew up comforting our parents and telling them that it was okay that they got divorced. And we became the parent, and they never grew up. And people wonder why we're disconnected and have a hard time making friends. <laughs> because we never had the security that you're supposed to have. It was the spirit in the air. Everybody was doing it. Nationalism. You ever go through the World War I Museum and just ask yourself why? Why did millions of French and English die? Because France is better than Germany. 
and we have to beat back the Hun. Why? Because they speak a different language and live on the other side of the line. I mean, there was no re- really. Do you think the prince of, uh, you know, Archduke Ferdinand was really worth that many millions of deaths? No, of course not. Nobody even knew who he was. Nash- what? Why would you die for that reason? Nazism. Why would you ever begin to think that? Your race was so superior that all other races needed to be extinguished, starting with Jews. Communism, why would you ever allow yourself to think that it's worth millions of deaths to bring about this revolution that's going to revolutionize the people who live? It's the spirit of the air bringing suffering, bringing death, the things that no one ever even thinks about. God didn't cause any of this. God is what's holding this world together. That's, he is the, the, the only reason why we still exist as a race. When you think about how good we are at extinguishing ourselves, it's amazing the human race still exists. And God is the reason why we exist. But why is he allowing so much suffering to go on? Why is he allowing so much suffering to go on? That's the question. And that's the problem of God's patience. The answer is, he still loves the good seed, and he's not willing for one of them to be lost. That's the the parable of the sower, right? Jesus stresses that when God created this world, he sowed good seed. It was good. And then Satan, the prince of the power of the air, he came in and he sowed awful seed in the midst of it, and and the weeds began to come up, and his gatherers come to him and go, you want us to rip out the, the bad seed? You know, that's a metaphor, right? Believers, the children of God, they're the good seed. And the evil are the bad seed. Those who don't know God, who turn against Him, who live their lives turned against Him. And God says, if I go and I tear out the weeds, I'm going to lose some of the good seed. Now look, everybody in here is a beneficiary of God not tearing out the bad seed. Either you were born a bad seed, and the Lord changed you, and you were converted later in life, or you grew up in the church because God changed some other generation. But none of you come from 2,000 years of Christianity. I can guarantee you that. Aren't you, if God had taken away all the pain in the world, you would have never been born. That's what that parable teaches. And God thought you were worth it. Yes, it was awful. Yes, he's been hurting along with us. Yes, he sees the pain. But if he ends it, we're not going to be here, and he thinks we're worth it. If God were to eradicate all the sin from the earth right now, we would all be gone. (laughs) Because it's so deep in us that we couldn't exist without it. And he loves us. He's known and loved us since before the creation of the world. And he's known it was going to require that kind of suffering to get us. And that's where the sermon turns. Okay, that's the reason why. But let's get to the heart of it. Just because God is patiently allowing pain does not mean he likes it. It does not mean he likes it. He hurts with us. He suffers along with us. He is not standing aloof with his arms folded. That's that's how we begin to think sometimes, isn't it? You could have done something, but you didn't. Why did you not do anything? And he, he gives us enough of an awareness of his heart that we can see that that's not true. That's why the story of Jesus coming to the tomb at Lazarus, of Lazarus is so beautiful. He could have gotten there before Lazarus died, but he waited because he wanted us to see two things. One, he wanted us to see his heart. He needed us to see him weeping, weeping, crying for his friend crying over death. God is not aloof. He's not uncaring. 
He's not a professor doing experiments, watching animals suffer. He is passionately involved with us. And he cries with us. And he cries over us. He, he reveals to us his heart. And in the Old Testament, over and over again, he says, why will you die? Why won't you come to me and find life? Jesus is looking over the city of Jerusalem that he loves so much and, and these people he loves so much and he knows that because of their rebellion, God, Rome is going to come in and destroy them and he says to them, why wouldn't you come to me? Why? And he cries over them, why wouldn't you come? You wouldn't come. I would have saved you, but you would not gather under my wings. Even now, he is experiencing our pain. And he didn't just watch it and cry a lot for us. He entered it with us. He entered it for us. He went through it for us. He became a man. This is so important. Uh, the Westminster Confession in the Shorter Catechism says this. Christ was born in a low condition, made under the law, Undergoing all the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, and the cursed death of the cross, was buried and continued under the power of death for a time. He experienced all of that voluntarily. This is, this is the crux for me. If this weren't true, I would totally ditch religion. Uh, it makes no sense. But because it is true, I can believe there's a... There's a statue in Brazil. You've all seen it. It's over Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it's called Christ the Redeemer, and it's a beautiful Art Deco statue that's thousands of feet above the biggest slum in the world, or one of them. Uh, probably the biggest slum in any nation other than India. If that's Jesus, I don't want anything to do with him. If he's standing over the slums uncaring, what, why would you worship that? But the truth is, he's come down from the mountain, and he has experienced the worst of that life with us and for us. Dorothy Sayers says, whatever reason God chose to make us as he is, he had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole of human experience, from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation and defeat and despair and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and thought it well worthwhile. Why was it worthwhile? Because he did it for us. He did it to be with us. He did it to, so that we would suffer not, not without reason, not even on our own. We suffer in Christ. Our sufferings right now are in Christ. And I see it all around. I see, uh, you know, I got two friends right now face, staring death right in the face. One's getting a pretty big surgery on, uh, on September 1st. And he told uh, my wife yesterday, I'm in the Lord's hands. I'm not afraid. That is somebody who knows he's suffering in Christ. He is inside of Christ going through his suffering because Christ has suffered for him. And he has been joined together with him. And that changes how we suffer today. But it offers us even more. It offers us, offers us the promise of glory. And that's where we're going to end. Look at the, back at the bulletin, Romans 8, 18. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed with us. That, that's a very strong phrase, not worth comparing. It's like, it's like the, the, the glory that's coming is so real that everything that came before it is going to seem like it was very short-lived and almost ethereal, almost like something you can't. Like, like a dream. You know, you wake up. I dreamed. I had a dream that was so vivid that for years I thought it was true. And then one time I was talking with somebody about the most famous person you've ever met. And I was explaining how I had had a conversation with the president. And my wife looked at me and went, that never happened. 
I was like, oh, yeah. And, and this picture that the Apostle Paul is telling us, it's, it's that when we wake up in God's presence, it's going to be so real that the suffering we've gone through will seem very short-lived and like a dream. It's going to be a place with no sin. Now, that doesn't, may not sound that great to you, living forever in a place of no sin. But I want you to understand what it means. It means that every person you meet, and there will be millions upon millions there, every person you meet is going to love you perfectly. Can you imagine that? One of the things I got from my mom was a family album. and There's a picture of me. Uh, I'm about this tall. I got a big old cowboy hat. got cowboy boots with spurs. got my cowboy vest. And I'm riding on a, uh, a rocking horse, if you remember... Uh, back in the 70s, those rocking horses with the four springs, you know. And just right on, I'm just doing this. And, and, you, and in the background of the picture, you can see my brothers and my mom and my dad, everybody just laughing and having a big time. And I look at that picture now, and I just go, buddy, you didn't know that was the best day of your life. That's as good as it gets right there. There's another picture of me the same day, asleep on the floor with my little plastic rifle beside me. I mean, that was a, there was nothing but pure joy and everybody around me smiling and laughing and loving me perfectly. That's what heaven is. It is a million years of every single person who looks at you looking at you like your grandparents. They just treasure you. And everybody you see brings you joy like they would if they were your grandkids. That's what it means to live without sin. It's a place where we never grow old. It's a place without death and no effects of death. When I was at, growing up, our church would always go to the uh, nursing home and, sing, and have worship service for them on uh, the fifth Sunday of the month, so about four months a year. And uh, they, we'd let them request hymns, and they would always request this hymn. I've never heard this hymn sung when it wasn't in a nursing home. And it was called... A place where we never grow old. And it's, it's, it makes an impact on you to listen to a bunch of very old people sing about a place where you never grow old. A place where you never hurt. A place C.S. Lewis describes heaven as a place where you can run and never get tired. And he asks, why would you want to do anything else? And it's a place in the presence of God. There's no negative voice. There's no whisper in your ear saying you're worthless. No whispering in your ear saying you don't deserve this. No whisper in your ear saying this is short-lived. You know, there's that hauntingness. There's a haunting presence to any joyful moment. Whisper, a whisper saying this won't be like this for long. But not in heaven. All we have is a smile of God, and we experience more and more of that smile the more we enjoy His presence. And the beautiful promise is you can begin enjoying it now. You can begin enjoying it now. He smiled so big at you when you came to church today. He's like, you made it. You got your kids to church. That's hard. You're all, you sang for Him. He's like, your voice is beautiful. No, it's not, Lord. Yes, it is. If you want to experience it now, you can. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, you know much better than we know that the miseries of this life are hard and that life is often dark and painful. And you're there. Every single suffering human is crying. Is your baby crying straight in your face? And Father, even though we don't understand all the ins and the outs, we do somehow see that you're allowing it because you love us. And one day you will hush the cries forever. And we pray that that day would be soon. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to sing uh, one final uh, song with the band here, and then uh, I'm going to...
do my best to answer your questions. We'll see. Uh, you, the uh, number you, it, to text them to is in the bulletin. Um, please feel free to ask me anything, and I will answer them until 1015. Please stand as we sing. watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe sin that left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow
Thank you. Please be seated. All right, we got some good ones here. And I'll do my best. Um, let's see. First question was about Bible translations. And I would say the ESV because everybody else is reading it. And uh, the New Living Translation because it's understandable. And then whatever version your mom read. Uh, because you need to understand her better. If Christ experienced all the cost of sin for us on the cross, it's a great question. Listen, why are we still experiencing suffering of sin post-cross and resurrection? Um, that's a great question, and the answer is uh, we suffer the uh, effects of sin. Uh, we were designed to run in a world full of people who loved us perfectly and loved God perfectly, and for us to live in a world filled with selfishness and people who love themselves causes, has consequences. It's like, um, you know, gasoline costs a lot last month, right? And you probably drained your checking account every time you went to get gas. Um, you could have put water in the tank. Would have been cheaper, right? Would not have been a wise thing to do. Your car wouldn't have run. Uh, when there is sin, the world is not running how it was intended to run. It's, it's running with water in the tank. And that's going to have effects on the people around it. Uh, but those are not paying for your sins specifically. It's just the effect of living in a world filled with sin. Um, that's a good question. A similar question is, you know, in the Old Testament, people were punished for their sin. Would you ever tell someone now that they were being punished for their sin? I would not ever do that. Um, because I don't, A, because it's not true. Um, I would say it's possible, I mean, it certainly is true that, you know, if you uh, live your life an alcoholic and die from cirrhosis of the liver, you're reaping the fruit of your sin. And I would say that the pain of sin is God's way of calling us to repentance. And so I would definitely say that, you know, C.S. Lewis said that pain is God's megaphone. He's trying to get our attention through it. And so I would, um, I think, I don't know. I'm so much bolder up here than I am down there. Uh, I'd probably never even say that, honestly. I'd probably just go, I'm really sorry. Um, you know, but I think that's an ad accurate thing to say. Uh, and people who are good evangelists will say that kind of thing. Um, but I'm not great at that. Um, would you explain any of this differently to a non-believer? Um, Yeah, I mean, there's a whole different track. It depends on them and why they're asking. You know, the difficulty of, um, of talking to non-believers about pain is you've got to figure out why they're asking. If they're just kind of being, you know, a sophomore in college, pseudo-intellectual moron, then, you know, I would just say, well, how do you even know what is evil? Why do you have a standard of good and evil? You wouldn't have that if you weren't created to run differently, uh, you know, and you can talk about that the whole way. Like, why, why, you know, why do you condemn the, the Holocaust? If there's no God in whatever, we can just do what you don't condemn a lion for eating an antelope. So, uh, so that's if you just want to quiet down that person. If you want to, um, but, you know, usually you get this question and there's a lot of pain in it, you know, and it's, uh, you know, the first person I ever had that conversation with, and I was, I was the one being the smart aleck and using the antelope illustration, and he, uh, he was just sad because his dad was his youth minister and uh, abandoned his family and committed adultery and ran off. And, um, you know, and I wish I had the wisdom then to say, I'm sorry, and God is sorry, and that's why we need to live under God's rules and not on our own. Um, you know, so it just depends. Um, there's no, like, one standard unbeliever out there. But, yeah, I, would, I, would exp I, I explained this today to believers, you know, kind of giving the, Bible, give the, giving the Bible's answer. Uh, does our suffering always work out for our own good or for the good of the church? Well, you asked that question, so you're probably wise enough to answer it. Um, yeah, I mean, our suffering, sell, I mean, first of all, God is working through our suffering. Suffering is just bad, and it's okay to call bad things bad. Uh, but yes, God, the answer is both. Sometimes, you know, the, the Bible tells us suffering produces character and character hope and perseverance and things like that. Um, 
it's in Peter. <laughs> I know where it is. I don't know the words. Um, but uh, so, yes, yeah, sometimes our suffering works to our advantage, and sometimes it, it always works to the good of the church. Always. Um, you know, it alerts the church and brings us to people's uh, needs. And a lot of times when we see someone else suffering, we forget about ourselves for a few minutes, and those, that's actually our holiest moments. So, yeah, God works together. God works all things together for the good of those who love him. Those who love him, that's the church. And so that's, that's Romans 8, 28. It is often um, misquoted. Last question. If we're never meant to die, how does that reconcile with limited resources and space? Isn't death just part of the circle of life? Uh, no, actually, and there's not limited resources in space. Uh, you're thinking just of the earth. Um, but our universe is ever-expanding. And uh, I personally believe that uh, when the book of Revelation says that in glory there is uh, a, a multitude that no man can number, I think that means that no man can number it. It's infinite, and we're going to, uh, you know, we've got this entire universe that needs to be populated, and we are developing the technology even now to get to other planets and to live on other planets. There's no reason to believe that our technology in heaven or after the resurrection is going to be worse than it is now. There's every reason to believe it'll be better. And so, uh, yeah, there's, there's not limited resources, actually. We have no idea. We've not begun to tap the resources in this universe or uh, the amount of space in this universe. And that's really exciting to me because I get bored easily. And I used to think, uh, I used to get really frightened at the thought of heaven. I was like, that's just going to be boring. I'm sorry, there's no way it's going to keep my interest. But then I started realizing that, you know, this, God created this, the, these heavens and this earth for our eternal uh, residence, and that's why the, the universe is eternally expanding. And so there's never going to stop being new worlds for us to discover and to populate. Uh, not populate it in the Mormon sense. I'm sorry. Why did I bring that up? Man, you stop talking. The thing I should have said was nothing. Please stand. And I just don't want you ladies to think you have to look forward to an eternity of bearing children. That would not be fun. I'm sorry. I don't care how you make it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to smile upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace both now and forever. Amen.